this um, historic moment of allowing thousands of lifers out of prison, it's a win-win for um, the people coming out and the public. Oh my God, it's all right. Oh my God. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're here with Katie Galloway and Kevin Bilal Chapman. Katie is one of the filmmakers behind the new documentary, The Return, which follows the journey of several former California prison inmates as they re-enter the world after serving decades behind bars under three-strike sentencing. Bilal is one of the subjects of the documentary and served 11 years in state prison after getting his third strike for selling drugs to an undercover officer. Katie, Bilal, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And Bilal, you've been out for almost three years now. What's the transition uh, from prison to the outside world been like for you? Transition for me has been um, pretty tough at times, you know. We had to get right into what I was going to do when I came back. I had to get my license. I had to get my IDs. I had to get um, my Social Security card, build a resume, and then work from there. And Katie, three strikes went into effect here in California in 1994. Could you explain just in basic terms, what is three strikes? And then how did it become so widespread in the United States? So California, I believe, was the second three-strike state. Um, it was passed in California after a couple of horrific um, gruesome incidents involving children and people who had um, been previously incarcerated and were now free. Um, and so there was legitimate fear, um, public fear and anger about how could this happen? The public was sold this idea that we were gonna take care of the worst of the worst, just the most violent, dangerous predators who were snatching children from their beds, that sort of thing. In reality, the way the law was written meant that, and this is the only three strikes state of now more than 30 in the country, where someone could in fact be sent to prison for life for a nonviolent, non-serious offense. So, they were called wobblers, and prosecutors mm -hmm. could decide whether they wanted to charge them as misdemeanors or felonies. And so there were things like stealing a bike from a garage or taking plastic glasses, you know, snatching them off a table at a, at a restaurant, um, or passing a bad check, or selling small amounts of drugs, which is what Bilal was doing to his friend, quote unquote, at the pub. So your sentence was six life sentences plus 150 years. Yes. What exactly did you do? So we have a little pub in my neighborhood, a little neighborhood bar. So we all used to go there, drink, play darts and stuff. And this guy inside the bar one day came up to me and a few of us and said, hey, do you guys, anybody here know how to, you know, just ask. Anybody know where to get any, uh, any math or something? I said, yeah, I'll get him something. So we did this a couple of times, had his phone number, called him a couple of times. And uh, each time he did this, I found out later he was an undercover cop. Wow. So I had prior strikes, so anything I did after that was a mandatory minimum of 25 to life. What were the previous two strikes? Um, I had theft years ago. Okay, so there was a big gap between the first two strikes and then... 16 years. Three strikes, it, to a lot of people it makes intuitive sense because you're, these are people who have committed two felonies and they've then committed a third felony or a misdemeanor that could be prosecuted as a felony. A lot of people don't even need two chances and we're giving people three chances. Explain why that is a misguided mindset. People age out of criminal behavior. I mean, the more research we do on the brain, uh, we've learned that, and it's something that's getting known more in sort of social science circles, the idea of transitional age youth from 18 to 25, your brain is not fully developed. And most of us who have either been 18 to 25 or know someone who <laughs> is, knows that a lot of really bad decisions are made. When those decisions um, intersect with things like class and race disparities and the way that uh, punishments are meted out, then you just have a, a really a, a bad situation for a huge swath of young people who then realize the error of their ways and have mo grown up um, and sort of moved on and are held to these crimes that they committed early on. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world here in the United States. But then on the other hand, crime has been going down, all violent crimes has been going down, so some people might say, well, 
putting all the bad people in jail has kind of worked. The percentage of three strikers is very small, like a drop in the bucket of the overall prison population. 650,000 people, many of whom people think of as the bad guys, right, because they went in once and they went in twice, are coming back out. So the numbers have just grown and grown and grown over the years, not just in terms of who's going in, but in terms of who's coming out. So I think that the causality breaks down right there from my perspective. Is there an alternative to just locking as many people up as possible for as long as possible while still reducing the crime rate? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. I really believe that. And there are plenty of, of studies, really good science, like broad-based studies that show that alternatives to incarceration, like mental health courts, like drug courts, um, make a positive uh, impact on the crime rate and on the lives of individuals. You can take it as, you know, sort of uh, the, the ethical mercy, moral argument in the lives of people who have struggled, or you can take the self-interest argument and say, what kind of com community do I wanna live in? Either way, you're gonna look at these studies and say it absolutely doesn't make sense to give people a felony record for a drug issue. There was an expert in the film who was talking about the psychological effects uh, of prison on people and especially when you have a life sentence and you start to believe that you're never going to get out and you start to accept that and then suddenly this change happens and you do get out that it's hard to get over that psychological barrier. Did you have any experience with that or did you see that when you were in prison? I without a doubt saw other people with that. I also, while I was there, I had made my mind up and I was pretty clear and pretty confident that I was never getting out, right? But then I had to make a choice. I wanted to be still a better person. I wanted to learn more about me. I wanted, and I was angry with me because I'm here again for the second time or the third time. So I was angry with me and I needed to forgive me. So I had to forgive me by making myself better. I had to find out what was my reasonings, what led me down those roads. That's what, just what I did. I also saw people who just had given up. You know, uh, a guy who stole a VCR or, or stole his mother's car because he was so strung out on drugs and he needed to get to where he's going. So she calls the police and he gets 50 to life for that, right? And his mother had, had made the call only because she wanted her son back, but she didn't know this was gonna happen to him. Mm -hmm. So then he is psychologically ruined the rest of his life. It was in the 1990s. Uh, at the federal level, it was under the Clinton administration that a lot of this tough sentencing was pushed. Now there's kind of like a bipartisan push to undo a lot of these, uh, these problems. Could you talk a little bit about the kind of strange politics of mm -hmm. uh, prison sentencing? It sure. has been a, a strange bedfellows story on uh, California and national criminal justice. I think, you know, what we saw in the 90s um, was a combination of things, but there was definitely the Willie Horton, Michael Dukakis moment. Dukakis actually didn't pardon him directly. It was a state policy of furlough where people could go home on weekends if there was certain good time behavior. Um, and he committed a gruesome crime uh, over the weekend, and it was just splashed all over the, the media. And Dukakis, you know, the, the finger was pointed at Dukakis. And so there was, I think, a terror <laughs> on the left or among Democrats um, of being that guy, right, who's weak on anything. And so it was, the Democrats were worse than the Republicans um, on criminal justice issues. It was like everybody was trying to outdo each other on tough on crime for years. Now, um, Wow, I mean, the fact that it's the, like the one issue that Democrats and Republicans can agree on, who would have thought back in the 80s and 90s as mass incarceration was growing? It has been fascinating to watch. A kind of incredible and frustrating part of the documentary is you show prosecutors who are fighting against the release of these nonviolent offenders who've been in prison for years or even decades for no seeming reason. They've, these people have never done anything in prison that indicates that they would, have, they would be a threat on the outside. What do you think is motivating these prosecutors to try to fight against the release of people? I mean, there's a tension within the role. 
to seek justice and to win. Mm -hmm. And too often, winning is what triumphs in terms of motivations. And prosecutors' offices are built by how many convictions they get, um, more money, more um, assistant DAs. So there's a real problem of there being an institutional incentive to not seek justice, but to win, and then to hold on to those convictions in many cases. People don't want, and you see this even in the innocence cases where there's new DNA evidence, yeah. people fighting because they don't want their convictions overturned. They don't want to see the law change. So why not fight these cases? Why not fight it? Why not go on record and saying, I didn't want this guy out. I don't want this guy out. I don't want this guy out. As many as possible. My understanding of the law is it's at their discretion. They don't have to fight these releases. Right. They don't. <laughs> They don't. It, it was really completely. It, it was. It was completely up to them. It was. They. They decided who they wanted to, who they wanted to contest and who they didn't. When it came up to me, mine was contested. My attorney said, "I have no idea why they're even contesting it, but they are. So let's go on with everything we have." So that's actually why he decided to do the film. He wasn't really that eager to be a, you know, no. to document his having sure. been a three striker no. for the world to see when he's trying to get rid of that history. But he was really at risk of not being let out and he yeah. wanted the sunshine in. What's the takeaway that the rest of the country can learn from what California did here with Prop 36? This um, historic moment of allowing thousands of lifers out of prison, it works. I mean, the recidivism rate is relatively very low and that it's something that people should be willing to take a chance on because the evidence points, and now there's very recent, um, I think Washington Post published a study yesterday that said of the 27,500 released under Prop 36 and Prop 47, uh, the evidence is that there, it hasn't led to any increase in crime. It's certainly led to huge savings and um, it's a it's a win-win for um, the people coming out and the public. Near the end of the documentary, you say that the stigma of being an ex-convict kind of follows you into every element of the outside world. Have, do you feel like that's still with you or have you been able to move past it and kind of lead a normal life now? No, that, that's always, uh, at this particular time in life, is always with me. You know, um, I'm still looked upon, and I just want to be looked upon as the man that I am today. The person that I am, I am not the same person I used to be. I've learned a lot about myself and I am. And I don't want to continue to be looked upon as that person or the things that I used to do that I'm ashamed of, that I wish I never had done. And I used to be upset with myself, but now I'm very happy with me. I'm very excited and I've forgiven me. So I'm not that person anymore. Bilal is a testament to the power of individual will and determination to overcome and succeed. But we shouldn't be making it that hard for people coming out. They've served their time. I mean, I think we have to think of it more like people returning from war, you know, with PTSD and attendant issues and how can we then um, help them in a way that also helps us as a society. The documentary is The Return. It premieres on PBS Monday, May 23rd. Katie, Bilal, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller. Thank you.